Amen. Hey, good evening. It's great to, to see you here, or I should say good morning if you're in Parker or at the McCulloch campus. Uh, wanna, uh, and I know it's, it's not the usual time here at our Sweetwater campus that uh, I would preach. Usually, you know, it's another song and, and everything like that, but uh, we're changing things up to this weekend, and uh, so I don't want you to be shocked by that. Uh, but I'm excited that we're here. So I'm going to invite you, since you're already seated, to go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. If you uh, have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, then go ahead and do it. Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to follow along with us, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're here at Sweetwater or at McCulloch. Uh, and if you're at Parker, there's Bibles on the table in the back. Uh, just get up and grab one of those and turn to page 963 and you will find our text, Matthew chapter 5, and we want you to be able to follow along with scriptures. And, and if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one with you. Whatever campus you're at, please take one of the Bibles and uh, we want you to have the Word of God. Read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. So I just invite you to do that and to, uh, uh, to make use of that. Hey, while you are getting settled and while you're finding Matthew chapter 5, uh, let me just tell you about something that's really good. I know you just heard a bunch of announcements about great things that God is doing. I'm excited about the kids at camp and, and uh, the camp we're hosting this week. But uh, last Sunday, we baptized between Parker Campus and uh, at the lake here and at a life group up in Havasu Heights, 44 people who express their faith in Christ. Isn't that cool? One day, three locations, and we had 44 baptisms. And I just got to tell you, I'm excited about what God is doing. And I know it's, uh, it's the middle of summer. It's starting to get hot. And as many people as can are running away from, you know, Lake Havasu right now, except if they, unless they have a boat and they're on the lake, right? But I... Sometimes it can feel like, oh, wow, is anything happening? The crowds are a little bit smaller, and where is everybody? They're going. God is working in amazing ways. God is, God is at work, and he doesn't care. In families, in children, in the lives of couples, and in senior adults, he's at work changing lives. And, and so uh, I just want you to, to be aware of that. Look around you uh, when you're, you know, at work this week or at the store this week or when you're any place you are and go, who can I invite to church this weekend? Who, who can I invite to come with me? Who can I say, hey, are you doing anything this weekend? Because if you're in town, whether it's Parker or Havasu, you're here for a reason. Uh, and uh, it's a great time to look around. Some, plus, there's a lot of new people coming in, a lot of people moving. This is the time of year people move. So look for those opportunities to say, hey, why don't you come and be a part of what God is doing because God is doing amazing things. And last weekend was evidence of that in spades. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I hope you're excited about that. And by the way, I kind of like the hot weather. I, I assume you guys do too. You live here, and it's June. So, Right? Hey, uh, what's the craziest thing that someone has asked you to do? I'm not going to ask you to share it with your neighbors because it may not be appropriate. But uh, <laughs> what's the craziest thing that somebody has ever asked you to do? I, I mean, you think about that, and, and I ask you that question, I started thinking about it going, nah, you know, I'm usually the one asking people to do crazy things like, you know, travel you know, overseas and do mission work in you know, scary places and stuff like that. So I, I don't know if it's, if it's a, a fair question uh, that way, but, but people ask us to do crazy things, and, and usually our reaction when somebody uh, says, hey, you're going to do this, is to go, no, that's crazy, right? I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. What are you thinking? That's crazy. Uh, well, Jesus came into the world to change our lives. I mean, last weekend we celebrated life change 44 different times. Jesus came into the world to change our lives. Uh, he, he gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins. He was raised from the dead to give us that promise of eternal life, uh, that hope of the resurrection. And, and here's the thing. If we follow Jesus, he will challenge everything about our lives. If you follow Jesus, he's going to challenge the way you think. He's going to challenge the way you live. He's going to challenge the way you work. He's going to challenge the way you conduct your relationships. Jesus really will turn your life upside down if you embrace his example and you embrace his wisdom. That's why this series is called Upside Down. Because the passage we're looking at this weekend 
it is probably one of the hardest ones to read, to listen to, uh, and demonstrates how Jesus will challenge everything about how we think life should be lived. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 38, we're going to look through the end of the chapter. Here's what Jesus says. And remember, he's already started his sermon. He's been teaching for a while. He's challenged the way that you thought it was about a lot of different things. And he says this. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now I don't know about you, but when you first glance at this passage, when you first read this passage, it is full of absurd expectations. Okay, I, I, am I the only one in the room that felt that way? I mean, you're reading this stuff, and most of the time we read it and we kind of go, yep, yeah, not doing that, not doing that, not doing that. And, and, and there have been, you know, teachers who've said this doesn't apply to us, it applies to other times, we don't have to do it now, uh, because it's so ridiculous in the expectations. I mean, is Jesus really suggesting that we allow people to assault us? Is he really suggesting that we allow people to get away with crimes or let people steal from us? Is he really suggesting that that we, you know, give away the farm, that we be enablers of, you know, addicts and moochers? Is that what Jesus is really asking of us? See, the answer is no. It's not. And and in fact, as we wrestle with this passage of of a, a challenging expectation... We need to understand, first of all, this is personal, not societal. Okay, this is personal, not societal. Uh, This is an ethic that is directed toward individuals who follow Jesus. So let me be really clear. If you're here and you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, then this is the ethic that Jesus expects you to live out day in and day out as his follower. This isn't a manifesto for national policy. This is not a statement on how the courts should handle sentencing or leniency. This isn't about financial policy. Okay, this is about how we live out our faith. This is about me and this is about you adopting a Jesus ethic for our lives. And therefore, it's challenging to every one of us. And and as such, what it's really ultimately about, what it really boils down to is, is this. This is about relinquishing your rights. This is about relinquishing your rights. See, the references that Jesus makes are from Old Testament law, and from uh, the laws of the day that he lived, the, the way that they're operating under Roman rule in uh, the Jewish state. And, and so he, he acknowledges rights that people have in this text. For instance, Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes from the Old Testament law, the lex talion, which is to limit revenge. See, a lot of times people go, oh, that's so harsh. An eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, that's, that's unfair. No, it's perfect fairness is what it is. It's justice. And, and, and they instituted that law so that people would not go crazy and take revenge. You know, think about blood feuds. You kill one of us, we kill five of you. You know, that, it, so you don't get disproportionate uh, uh, action to, to mete out the punishment. And so he said, that's what you've heard it said. So in other words, he's saying you have the right to justice. 
A slap on the cheek, by the way, is not an assault. It's an affront. It was a way of communicating, I have disdain for you, and I'm challenging your honor. So it, it was basically public humiliation. Uh, and, and so Jesus says, hey, you have the right to protect your honor. Because the, the, to answer that, you would slap the person back, and then it would be a, a, a formal uh, debate, discussion, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so he says, you have the right to defend your honor. The, the thing about suing for the tunic. A Jewish man, most Jewish people, would, uh, would have two tunics and one cloak. And the law said that they could sue for one tunic, but they had to give you your cloak back in the evening so you'd have something to cover up with. They couldn't keep your cloak. That was the law. You had the law to protect your private property and the things that, that would pr protect your assets and promote your own interests. The reference to force to go one mile. That was under the Roman occupation of Israel. See, Rome had conquered Israel, and they were ruling there, and they were a, a military power. They were occupying the country, and they could force you to do something for them. In other words, they could force you to carry their pack for one mile. One mile. That was the, that was the law. So that you, whatever you were doing, a soldier could interrupt you, and you were compelled to carry that for one mile. You know, you know who's an example of that in Scripture? You probably already know this. Simon of Cyrene. He was compelled by Roman law to carry the cross of Jesus. They forced him to do it. It was law. One mile. You have the right to do the minimum that the law requires. Okay? That's, that's what he said. You, you're protected by the law. And Jesus acknowledges these rights in real life circumstances. And everybody who's listening to him goes, okay, I get that, I get that, I get that. And then, this is, you know, just sheer audacity on Jesus' part. He challenges us to abandon our rights one after the other. You have the right to this, but I'm challenging you to give them up. And that's absurd. Especially to us, isn't it? I mean, we're a nation that's built on individual rights. We know our rights. We hold on to our rights. We defend our rights. We claim our rights. And Jesus says, give them up. Relinquish your rights. Yes, you have them, but voluntarily lay them aside. Because this is the Jesus way. And, and think about this. Jesus upends common sense and self-preservation. He just attacks it. He just goes, you don't need it. And he introduces this radical shift in how we think and how we live and how we relate. That's what this is. Jesus is introducing a radical shift in the way that the people who follow him are to think and live and relate. And for every single one of us, this is a challenge from Jesus to us saying, Hey, are you going to live by my ethic? Are you going to embrace this? You say you're my followers. Are you really going to own that? And do this. Because he says this is the family path. This is what the children of God do. Did you notice that when he says, so that you may be sons of your father which is in heaven. This is how we know you're sons of your father which is in heaven. This is how we know you're children of God. If you embrace this ethic. Because this is what the family does. This isn't easy. Jesus never said it would be easy. After all, he said, you know, hey, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and come after me. He told us this wasn't going to be easy. In fact, this is going to require crazy faith. It's going to require insane obedience and a wild commitment to endurance. This is radically believing Jesus. That his way is absolutely the best way. And that his way is going to lead to victory. Even if no one else can see it. Now, if you have this kind of faith, or if you desire this kind of faith, then let's talk about what followers of Jesus have the right to. Okay? We're going to talk about what Jesus says we have the right to. He's talking about rights. He says, I want you to relinquish, relinquish the light rights that you've lived by, and I want you to embrace some new rights. 
the rights that followers of the Son of God, the Savior of the world, can really own and can really embrace. And if we embrace these rights, it'll transform our lives, it'll turn our lives upside down, and we will have the victory that we sing about and we so desperately want. See, this is how Jesus turned our rights upside down. So follow with me, if you will. So followers of Jesus, first of all, have the right to forgive. We have the right to forgive, right? Which is why we turn the other cheek. It's about grace. We institute mercy instead of clinging to the right for justice. We don't have to hold on to this idea we want justice because we want to be people of mercy. We want to offer grace to others. Always. Especially when they don't deserve it. Especially when they don't deserve it. How many times do we say, well, they don't, they, they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve grace. They don't deserve it. No, none of us ever deserve grace. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. It would be payment. Grace is a gift. You don't ever deserve it. I don't deserve it. Every one of us deserves hell. We earn the right to go to hell. The wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is grace. And, and, and so we have the right to forgive. Because that's what Jesus did for us. And so that means we choose to reject bitterness and anger and vengeance. as not even being options. We're, we're not even going to embrace those as options. They're not even on the table. We, we just, we're going to be people who forgive. And, and we realize and trust that forgiveness blesses us more than the recipients. See, what we, don't, what we fail to understand a lot of times is that when we forgive others, it blesses us more than it blesses them. When you forgive somebody who has wronged you, it's going to bless you more than it blesses them. Now, it's going to bless them, hopefully. Hopefully they're going to, you know, go, wow, that's great. I, I got to receive grace. I got to receive mercy. That's wonderful. Some people take that for granted, by the way. So not everybody will see it as a blessing. But you're going to bless them. And when you do that, here's what happens. God cleanses your heart and frees your soul. Forgiveness is a blessing for you. And it transforms the world when you give it. Now, if someone breaks the law, you can forgive them personally while holding them accountable legally. There's, no, there's not any struggle there. Okay, I want you to hear this. If somebody breaks the law, uh, then you can, you can forgive them personally and hold them accountable legally. Because there's a lot of life change that happens in prison. I'm just saying. We got a lot of testimonies about that too. So, we have the right as followers of Jesus to forgive and we have the right to serve, right? He says, go the extra mile. You're compelled to go one mile, go two miles. Now that's crazy. The people who hear that are thinking Jesus has lost his marbles. We hate the Romans. We want to kill the Romans. We want to throw them out. And you're saying, do twice as much as you have to. That's nuts. But Jesus says, you have the right to serve. And by the way, when you have a right to serve, do it with a joyful attitude, not grudgingly with a do-what-you-have-to kind of mindset. Right? Because which one works better for you? All right, let's go do it because we have to. Yeah, we signed up to help out in the nursery. We got to go work in the early childhood wing. Let's get this over with. Oh, we got to go to church early because you decided to be a greeter. Right? I mean, how much fun is that? That doesn't bless anybody. But if you go, hey, I have the opportunity to go bless children in Jesus' name and, and allow some parents to go and hear a sermon, great. I have the opportunity to go and welcome people into the house of God and let them know that they're cared for and valued, great. Because we have the right to serve others joyfully in Jesus' name. And by the way, guess which way has more power? Yeah, absolutely. See, Jesus taught that serving others is the path to greatness. 
If you, if you don't know the passage, it's Matthew chapter 20. I encourage you to go home and read it tonight. The, the, the disciples are arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is like, you guys are clueless. You don't get this. It's not like the Gentiles do. It's not about lording over your authority over other people. It's about serving. And the one who wants to be great should be the servant of everyone. He says, look, I'm the son of God and I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You have the right to serve. And it's the path of greatness. So here's the reality. Most of us either don't believe Jesus or we aspire to mediocrity. Right? Because if we believe Jesus, what would we do? We would embrace the right to serve and we would be the most enthusiastic servants that exist. By the way, we take this seriously here at Calvary. That's why we do all these projects that drive some of you crazy. What? Now we've got to go paint down in Parker. Yes, we're going to go paint down in Parker. Because we have the right to serve. And we want to let that community know that Jesus loves them through his people loving them. And that's what we're doing. And we want to do it there. We want to do it here. We want to do it to the ends of the earth. Uh, because we have the right to serve. And when we serve, it unleashes the power of God in our lives. So I want to challenge you. Aspire to greatness. Trust Jesus. Embrace your right to serve. So you have the right to forgive, you have the right to serve, and we have the right to give. That's right, Jesus says embrace the right to give. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, the truth is most of us are way more focused on getting than in giving. Okay, I mean, you know, it's got to work hard. We got to get it. We got to take care of the family. And once we take care of the family, maybe we'll think about sharing with some other people. But then we got all these needs. We got to make sure we got enough inheritance for the kids and the grandkids and take care of all that kind of stuff. We got to take care of us. It's all about getting and having and holding on to it and preserving it and, and, and all of that. And look, Scripture teaches a lot about stewardship and about wisdom and investing and all that. Uh, but Jesus just turns our approach to life upside down by challenging us to give away our stuff instead of focusing on holding on to it. I mean, you read that and you just go, okay, if they sue you and take that, give them that too. And if somebody asks, just go ahead and give it to them. And, and by the way, Jesus was speaking to primarily poor people. He was not speaking to a bunch of rich people. He wasn't like at the Beverly Hills Convention Center. He was on the side of a hill with a bunch of peasants who came out to hear him. These were subsistence farmers and fishermen who were living day to day. You know, that's why he taught them to pray. We'll look at this in a couple of weeks. Give us this day our daily bread because they lived day to day. And, and they didn't have reserves and they didn't have bank accounts and they didn't have, you know, stuff set aside for retirement. And Jesus says, be generous. Be generous. Be focused on giving rather than on getting. So how can we do this? I mean, seriously, how can we do this? And, and, and I just want to tell you, it boils down to trust. Do we trust God enough to provide for us? And do we trust God to provide enough for us? Because greed always wants more. We always want more. If we had a little bit more, it'd be nice. If we had just a little bit more, if we had a little bit more, it'd be, oh, we'd feel so much better if we had a little bit more. All right. It's how my heart works. I assume it's how your heart works too. And Jesus says, look, the way that you confront that greed that's in your soul, that, that ownership that money and the love of money wants to have on your soul is to just practice giving it away. Just practice giving it away. And, and when you give it away, you're saying, hey, God, I trust you to take care of me rather than try and take care of myself. This is one of those places where our faith tends to hit a wall. It's a very emotional subject. Last time that uh, I, I preached on giving, uh, I got a communication that simply said I should apologize. Uh, seriously, somebody was uh, that offended and said, no, it's not, not fair. I don't have enough money to give. And, and, I, I, and, and I'm just sorry. I, I, I can't preach it. And, and honestly, someone, and a lot of people have this conversation, well, I don't have enough to give, so I serve. I'm like, great, thank you for serving. God wants us to serve. But you know what? When I read this passage, I don't see that it's one or the other. I kind of see it as both that Jesus is asking for. One's not a substitute for the other one. He's like, I don't have to serve, I give a lot. Or I don't have to give, I serve a lot. Well, you can tell yourself that, but that's not what Jesus is saying. It's kind of blunt. 
It's kind of out there. It kind of challenges our ethic. We need to go ahead and listen to him. And, and, and the only way to fight the tendency towards greed is to give regularly and to excess. Because the more we give, then the easier it is to give. And the more you give, the more you see God work in your life because he frees you from greed and you become way more grateful for what God has, has done for you. So the, the question is, do we trust God enough to embrace this radical ethic and embrace the right to give? By the way, God has given everything to us. We're his children. We have eternal life. We're joint heirs with Christ. We get everything in the end. So we have the right to give. Let's give. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, each one should decide in his heart how he wants to give. Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's our right, and it's our birthright. So we have the right to forgive, we have the right to serve, we have the right to give, and we have the right to love. Verse 43, Jesus said, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Maybe the most radical statement that Jesus ever made. By the way, in the Old Testament, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, pretty much taught all the time because why? They were going to war. They were fighting for their freedom. They were fighting for their nation. They had prayers to smash the, you know, the enemy's heads with rocks and stuff. It was you know, gruesome. And, and Jesus just challenges that Old Covenant way of thinking and saying, no, love your enemies, which is absurd. Let's just go ahead and call it out. It's absurd. If we truly want to represent Jesus, though, we have to get this. We have to understand this. We have to love even our enemies. Now, it doesn't mean you have to like your enemies. It doesn't mean you have to surrender to your enemies. It doesn't mean you have to capitulate or become a, a doormat. It's not what Jesus is saying. It means that Jesus is telling us that the path to victory for us and for his kingdom is love. The path to victory for God's kingdom and for you and I is love. There's no other path to victory, by the way. The path to victory is not going to come through anger. Whether you express that anger in person or in social media, you're not going to win anything by being angry. Okay? That, that's just honest. It's love. You, by the way, you're not going to win through politics. Look, I know politics impacts our lives and we care about it, but elections are not going to be our redemption. Jesus is. And we need to love. Yes, we should vote our conscience and vote for what we think is best, but that's not our hope. Our hope is in love. Victory is not found in violence, it's not found in power, it's not found in wealth, it is found in love. So if we want to win at life, we've got to love all the time. And by the way, love is patient. And love is kind. You can read the rest in 1 Corinthians 13. So how do we do this? How do we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? Um, this is where it all starts. And, and so, and again, this is not about a geopolitical statement. This is not about a national statement. This is about personal. So you're not thinking about your enemies like ISIS or Russia or something like that. You're thinking about the people in your life that have offended you, that have hurt you, that are against you. Most of us, when I say, who's your enemy, people go, I don't have any enemies. Oh, really? Well, who ticks you off? Because that's your enemy. Who makes your blood pressure go up when you think about them? That's your enemy. Who do you not want to be around? Yep, it's your enemy. Who's hurt you? That's your enemy. So what do we do with that? How do we love them? Well, first of all, you pray for them. And when I say pray for them, I mean you pray for them by name and you pray for God to bless them. See, because some of you are like, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that they get in a car accident. I'm going to pray that God drops a rock on their head. I'm going to pray that, you know, no, it, it's, you know, that's not what he means. It's pray for them that God would bless them. Pray that they would know the love of Christ. Pray that God would change their life so that they could be a person who loves and blesses and helps and heals. You know, uh, pray for joy if they're just mean. You know, it, it, it's, it's amazing what happens. So you begin to pray for them. 
And, and, and what happens when you pray for them is that God changes your heart. God changes your heart, and one day you're not angry at them anymore, and you've forgiven them. You really have forgiven them. And, uh, and then God's going to give you an opportunity to bless them. I don't know what that opportunity is going to look like, but it may be a kind word. It may be showing them respect. It may be, uh, you know, feeding them. It may be just, you know, showing them kindness, even if they don't give you any respect or kindness back. And that sounds crazy. And, yeah, from the world's perspective, it is. Sounds difficult, and you're absolutely right, it's difficult. But is it powerful? Absolutely. Absolutely. It'll change your life. And so if we do this, if we embrace the Jesus ethic, if we embrace forgiveness and we embrace uh, serving, we embrace giving, we embrace loving, it changes everything. It changes every conversation. It changes our social media impact. It changes our interactions with people that we meet. It changes the way we relate to our family, our in-laws, even our exes. Because if we follow Jesus, we care more about others than our rights. Because that's what Jesus did. And this will turn your life upside down. And you'll rejoice. If you're willing to follow Jesus, if you're willing to trust Jesus, he will do that in your life. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us in an incredible way, extraordinary way, and demonstrating that love for us on the cross where you paid for our sins. And, and we simply want to say thank you, and we ask that you would teach us how to follow you, how to embrace this ethic that is your kingdom's way of living and loving and serving and forgiving. God, we need the Spirit to overwhelm us with his presence. We need the Spirit to apply the, apply the truth to our hearts in, in a powerful way so that we can be confronted with how we live and so that we can repent and follow Jesus like never before. You're calling us to follow and to turn our lives upside down, and we invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.